we're going to get this thing started. So I'm going to leave it all to our guest today, introduction and everything. Uh, today we have Chris and our friend Vic in the house. And uh, this is going to be an amazing opportunity uh, to learn a lot, especially if you're running a, a, a startup or if you're thinking about running a startup, uh, definitely take advantage of this meeting. So it's going to be fireside chat style as we've done multiple times. If you have a question, as always, drop it in the chat and Vic will get to it. And um, I think I'm covering all the bases. Vic, Chris, I'll let you guys introduce yourselves. Um, give it the rundown. And yeah, I'm super excited. Thank you for joining us once again. And let's get into it. Thanks for having us. Um, I'll give you guys a five second background on me. So irrelevant. Uh, I, I, uh, I'm an entrepreneur here in the Valley, Cal Poly 2004. Um, I help a guy named Joe Lonsdale, who's a Palantir co-founder, start kind of every company since Palantir. Um, and today I basically run a family office managing my money and then the, the back office for two of the original PayPal founders um, and six other people, one of which is Lonsdale. Um, Chris and I, I mean, very similar networks. Um, Reed was a PayPaler, if you guys have read the book, but I'll let Chris give you, Chris, can you give us a background on you, family, where you're raised, and then, you know, how, how you got from business consulting to like wearing jeans and a t-shirt? I think that would be a good. So, let me be clear. I'm not wearing jeans. I'm wearing shorts. Even better. <laughs> Even, there's no business consultant wear shorts. Exactly. So I'll give you guys a quick rundown. I grew up in Southern California. So Santa Monica for any SoCal natives out there. And then I came up here to go to college and then eventually off to the East Coast. I spent a couple years in Boston before I actually came back out to Silicon Valley in the year 2000, which is probably before many of you were born, which is terrifying, but so be it. And I've been in the world of, there we go, selfies from Santa Monica, that's awesome. I, I grew up on Princeton Street, so near, uh, near 26th and Santa Monica. Anyways, so I, I, I've spent the past 26 years in the startup world. I got involved in the startup world in 1995, although somehow I was one of the dumbest guys imaginable because I left Silicon Valley to go to Boston during the dawn of the startup age probably cost me a lot of money. Uh, but anyways, so I've been an entrepreneur, uh, I've been a, a, an operator and an entrepreneur for a long time. For those of you who are interested, uh, my main, I came up mainly through the marketing side of the house as opposed to sales or engineering, although I do have an engineering degree in product design engineering, as well as a degree in creative writing. And what happened is along the way, I was like all these other folks starting companies, not as successfully as, as Victor's clients and friends, but, you know, doing OK. And then it turns out that uh, one of my friends, Reed Hoffman, ended up being a pretty successful guy himself. And in 2011, he and another friend of mine, Bren Kaznoka, came to me and said, hey, you know, we're doing these writing projects. Would you be interested in collaborating with us? And I said, well, I only got one question, which is, does my name appear on the cover of what we produce? And they said, yes. I'm like, okay, I'm in. So since that time, I've sort of been gradually moving over during the first book we wrote, which was The Alliance, which came out in 2014. I was actually simultaneously a VP of marketing and running a small micro fund and writing a book at the same time, which is not something I would necessarily recommend, but you know, I did it. And then uh, after that, I shifted over to more focused on being an author and also being an investor at a small venture capital fund that Victor has helped me with some wonderful introductions. And we can always talk about that later on if anyone's curious. Uh, and today I spend most of my time working with Reed, thinking of different books and other things we're to work on, recording podcasts, uh, but then also just trying to find awesome entrepreneurs. And I think that's one of the great things about where we live, although again, we're all kind of virtual right now, but what, what's wonderful is there are so many people who are out there just trying to do amazing, amazing things and everyone's out here to support them. And that's why I'm here today. I'm glad to be talking to you guys. I imagine that five years, 10 years, long after, you know, hopefully Victor, and I don't look that much older, but you know, five, 10 years, you guys are the ones that they're all writing books and stories about. So hopefully you remember us old guys when that time comes. Yeah. And remember that old people still can do stuff. I remember, Chris, I mean, we, we both fell into the trap of, of thinking 40 year olds were too old for the game and it's getting kind of close to 40 for me. So it's a little dangerous. But well, I blew past 40 a long time ago, but you see what I knew was, I think like a lot of you, 
in my early days, I'm like, okay, you know, I'm the, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a kid wonder, uh, that sort of thing. I'm the youngest person in the room and all that sort of thing. And then eventually I looked around, I'm like, oh crap, I'm not the youngest person in the room anymore. And I immediately <laughs> leaned hard into being the old guy. I'm like, okay, now I'm going to emphasize how old I am and my gray hair and everything else. And so I'm riding that for a while. We'll see how long it takes. And hey, you can't, it's, it's, you end there, right? You're, you're old and you're gray hair. We're, we will end in that role, Chris. Um, but what's scaling, if you guys don't have the book, it's a great book. It's a pretty quick read. Um, it's one of these books that has a lot of case studies. I mean, I think that's a good way to think about it. And I, I do consider it, and it is considered one of these like must definitive Valley books. There's Zero to One by Peter Thiel. There's Lean Startup by Eric Reese. Uh, Blitzscaling is in there. And some people will tell you like Delivering Happiness, which is the book about Tony Shea, is a great book. Um, but Chris, why don't you give us the rundown for those here who have not read Blitzscaling. Just, just high level, what is Blitzscaling? Yeah. So the way we came up with Blitzscaling is we looked at Reed's own career as an entrepreneur and investor and operator and said, well, what's the animating principle behind this? And Reed, of course, is one of the co uh, one of the founding board members of PayPal, uh, the co-founder of LinkedIn, the first investor in Facebook, the Series A lead investor in Airbnb, and many, many other incredible things. And what we concluded was what set his career and ultimately, by extension, Silicon Valley apart was this notion of we're really going to be aggressive about going after these winner take most markets. And the thing is, there used to not be that many winner take most markets. You know, the world existed, it was all divided up by geography and all these different things. But now that we have the internet, including Zoom bringing us all together, more and more markets tend to be winner take most markets because they're interconnected and because they're global. And so in that kind of world, and we call that, uh, we call them Ricky Bobby markets after Talladega Nights, because Ricky Bobby said, if you ain't first, you're last. In that world, the dominant strategy should be beat your competitors to scale, win the market, and then print money for decades. And we had to come up with a term for it, because if you don't come up with a, a new word no one's used before, you can't copyright it and make money. So we came <laughs> up with the term blitzscale. And the way we define blitzscale is we call it the pursuit of rapid growth by prioritizing speed over efficiency in the face of uncertainty. And what's important about that is it's really all about speed. The efficiency is secondary. It doesn't mean to waste money, but it just means that, you know, there are times when saving money by taking more time just doesn't make sense and acting in an environment of uncertainty. And this is the big thing, right? It's very easy to be aggressive once everything's certain. But if you're waiting until everyone recognizes the opportunity, then you're not going to be the one who seizes the early lead and becomes the winner in the market. Yeah. And it's, it's a good point out for those of you who have not read it. It is one of the strategies of the big companies, right? You have to run. I, I, I hear this when I, when I talk to non-venture investors and they're like, why can't Google do that idea? Like, well, I, Google, Google can do anything. It's, it, but what Chris is saying is, is the defense. You need to run. You need to run when they're not sure you should be running. But Chris, how do you know when you should run and when you should maybe stop running? Excellent question. So one of the things we really lay out in the book, this is probably the most important lesson to pull from the book, is that there are certain factors that tell you whether or not a market is actually a blitz scalable market and whether you should pursue the strategy. Because guess what? In most cases, you shouldn't blitz scale, right? If you look around, the, 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 the whole entire landscape is littered with companies like, for example, WeWork, where well, they were $15 billion in, maybe $9 billion out, maybe, that doesn't seem like it was a good equation. And the thing is, if you really sat down and did the analysis, you would say, well, wait a minute, is this actually a winner take most market? So the things that we're looking for are the following. The first thing is something that's gonna make it a winner take most market. In the technology world, most of the time, that's going to be a network effect. And what a network effect means is, as you increase the number of customers or users for something, the value of the network to those individual customers and users increases with scale. And the reason this is really important is, well, if you're increasing the number of users and you're increasing the value per user, pretty soon you've got exponential growth in value. But the other thing is, because you're increasing network value per user, you eventually get to the point where the network value dominates everything else. So if a new person, new entrant comes into the market, clones what you're doing exactly down to the pixel and offers it to the market for free, they won't get any traction because they don't have the network value. They only have the product value. 
There are some other ways that you can end up with a winner take most market other than network effects. So we make an exception. We say sometimes there's like a land grab. So the example we use in the book, because we wanted to prove it wasn't just about tech, is in the oil and gas industry, shale and fracking became very huge in the US in the 2000s. And the reason that a couple of companies made so much money doing it is because they realized that the new technology enabled this kind of extraction before other people did. And they just went out and bought all the mineral rights they could when everyone thought it was worthless. And so if you're buying stuff that people think is worthless and it's worth a huge amount of money, that's a great way to lock it in because those mineral rights leases are for 99 years, which is effectively forever. I mean, who cares what happens in 99 years? I don't plan to be around. Maybe, maybe Vic's got a line into some people who've got some things that are going to allow him to be around. Hopefully he'll share that with me when the time comes. They're trying, Chris. Um, I think another one of my takeaways from the book is that everything is a high margin business at the end of the day that blitz scales. Right? Like you can't blitz scale something whose margin at the end of the day is 4%. Right. These are like Absolutely. Zara, this clothing company is another one of your examples of a non-tech. And that's like, we, we could argue that these, these trackers are tech, right? We're, we're applying technology to useless land that is now useful. But Zara is really no tech. That is just a high margin, super high, like the highest margin in clothing kind of foot scale. And it's an astonishing example. So the thing about Zara, if you've ever you know, gone shopping, you've probably seen their stores. What sets them apart and makes them really different from the other clothing retailers is the approach they take, which is all based around speed. And so what they do is they get a design from the point at which they saw it on the street because they, you know, they don't make up their own stuff. They just clone other people's stuff. From the time they saw it on the street to the time it's in the stores is less than two weeks. And that's in contrast to, let's say, you know, the Gap or even H&M, where it's going to be a six month cycle or longer. So they sacrifice some of the efficiency for speed. They do their manufacturing in Spain, not in China or Indonesia, and they ship everything overnight. And that has some cost, and that's not as efficient in many ways, but it doesn't matter because since they make the products faster, they make them to order, they get them to the market quickly, they don't have the massive, massive inventory and more importantly, unsold inventory that consumes so much of the margin. So they're actually higher margin despite having higher costs. And now the, I, I'm a little sad about that because I'm a cheap bastard. I like to buy those clothes that they built up too much inventory of and pick them up. But, you know, H, uh, Zara has become the most valuable clothing retailer and manufacturer in the world by taking this approach. Yeah. Amazing company. Amazing company. Chris, the true blitz scale, you need a lot of capital. So there are very few, at the end of your book, you point out to a few areas, and I agree with you, Austin, Salt Lake City, New York City, LA, that are, that are becoming the new, you know, new centers like the Valley, where you, where you can absorb a lot of, or find a lot of capital. But say you're in the middle of Alabama, and you're starting a company. Do, do, you, do you not blitz scale if you're in Alabama? Because you have no access to, not, not, not as much access to capital. Yeah, so I think what you end up having to do in some of these secondary markets is you end up having to get through the early stages of growth without blitzscaling. And so part of blitzscaling, remember, is the competitive thing. So the more the competition is aware of you, the more likely it is that you're going to have to gear up and scale faster. So if you're outside the major markets, you're sort of operating below the radar, you may have a little more leeway to do this. And there are some advantages, right? During the early days, the costs are a lot lower and you may be able to get your learnings more cheaply. But then when the time comes to grow, you need to go out and get that traction. Now, the interesting thing is before the pandemic, the answer, if you went to an investor here in Silicon Valley would be, well, you have to move here. Right now, and again, this may not last forever, that's not as clear. Like I was just looking at one company, uh, so Union Square Ventures, very famous venture capital firm super successful. They're investors, for example, in Coinbase, which has just paid off big time for them. Well, I don't think they've distributed yet. Vic will know when they're distributing, I'm sure. Not unlocked yet, sir. <laughs> so, uh, but Union Square Ventures just invested in a bank in Brazil. That would have never happened before the pandemic. Not a chance. And so if you have traction, if you have a good story and explanation for why you are where you are, there's a greater chance currently. Now, again, I do think that there's going to be a lot of snapback because at the end of the day, I think ultimately 
we've learned to live without being in, in, with people in person. But Vic was just telling us before we started, hey, he drove out to Lafayette to get a deal done. And that was an advantage. Somebody who couldn't drive out and be on the person's doorstep was probably going to lose out. And so it will still be the case that to get into hotly contested deals or to build an amazing product when you want to work together with people, maybe you're not, you know, uh, everyone concentrated in Silicon Valley, but a lot of the key people are going to be in these major areas. And even if they're not, you're going to bring people together for an extended stay for a month at a time in order to really work together. Yeah. I was telling Armin when we talked a while ago that the Valley is very strange. You have to explain it to people that aren't based here. Because Chris and I fight to get into a deal. It's like, please take my money over Chris's. It's basically what I have to say. Yeah. Because there's very limited capacity of, of the really hot deals. So Chris, we're, we're talking to a group of people building companies in San Luis Obispo, where it's lovely. SLO. I will, I will take you anytime you want to go. It's a, it's a lovely place to live. There, there's, there seems to be a lack of investor capital looking for high, high risk ideas. So if, you, if you're out there, what, what would you do to build a company? What would you start? How would you run it until you get to the stage where you move to a, a capital center to raise money? Right. So the first thing is, and you know, when we talk about blitz scaling, we talk about blitz scaling at one end, which is you're prioritizing speed over efficiency in an environment of uncertainty. And one of the other ones is what we call the startup phase. And that's when you're prioritizing efficiency over speed because you're, you're not sure what's going on. And so you just need as long a runway as you can to figure things out. This is a great time to do that. This is a great time to try things. And again, the focus is on learning as quickly as possible. It's not on, hey, I want to scale up as quickly as possible because you might be scaling something that's terrible, right? You got to figure out if people actually want it, if you actually want to be in charge of the company. I, by the way, ran into this problem. My very first company that I started, I'm like, shit, I wish that I weren't running this company, but because I'm the one who's running the company, I can't leave. That sucks. So make sure you're building a company you actually want to be a part of. But then the other part of it is, and again, this is where SLO is not that far south, right? <laughs> you can actually make it, if Vic can drive to Lafayette, you can make the drive up occasionally to visit parts of Silicon Valley, develop some of those relationships. Again, set it up in advance. So you're not just like going to drive up and, okay, I'm here. But, you know, say, hey, I am going to be in the area. This is what we always do, right? I'm going to be in the area. Not if you say no, but I'm going to be in the area. <laughs> and I would love to get together and talk to you. And one of the things I always tell people about investors is, let me tell you, they're, an investor would much rather put money into their close friend, Vic, than random person who they just encountered. And so the trick is to start developing the relationships before you need the money. Yeah. And then when you need the money, you're actually doing them a favor by reaching out to them, making sure they're aware of what you're doing. Yeah, you get to say you're welcome, right? You're, you're welcome. And Lane, yes, come I'm on ready. up. I'll have lunch with you. Or one of these days when Vic and I come down, then we'll come and, down. And you guys a visit, we'll have lunch. I spend a lot of time down there. Chris, I don't, I don't know how often Chris does, but he can, he can ride with me. I haven't I gone that often. I've stopped in SLO before because uh, I, as, as you guys heard, I grew up in Santa Monica. And while it is faster to take the five than to take the 101, uh, my family doesn't like taking the five. Our, our dog would get car sick. And so we take the 101. And so it's not, you know, we, I've stopped in SLO a couple of times. Sometimes I stop in Santa Maria. You know, just pick different spots along the way. To pause. We're, we're stopped at Santa Maria, silliness. I mean, come on. Santa, Santa Bar Maria style barbecue. Santa Barbara or San Luis Obispo. Okay, there's like not much in between those two. Um, One of my good friends grew up in Santa Maria. He's a big fan of Santa Maria style barbecue. It's it's, it's a fun, I'm sure it's a fine place. I just that's where I used that's where Costco used to be for all you Cal Poly kids that have been there. While there's a Costco in Slow, I used to drive to Santa Maria for my lasagna. So that was oh my god, that's a long way to go for Costco. Yeah, but lasagna is delicious. That so, is true. Yeah. <laughs> so Chris, I mean. What, okay, say say you want to say, if you guys read the book, there's this concept of the different sizes of companies, family, tribe, village, city, nation, call it every 10, so 10 people yeah. is a family, 100 people is a tribe, 1,000 people is a village, so on and so on. So look, I, I like until uh, tri tribe-ish size. So we helped, I helped Joe start Adapar, and we grew from three people the first year to seven people the second year to 43 people the third year which is a disaster, 
Like you don't, that growth curve is really bad, right? You get to 43 ish people, you know, the next curve, the year after that, they finished at 170 people. I left when it was still around 70. Um, talk about Chris, like you didn't like running your company, the different stages when you move between these, these tiers, who, who's right for each stage? So this is one of the important things that you got to realize about yourself. And as you can tell, Vic knows this, not everyone likes every stage. And it may even be that you have the talents for the stage, but if you don't like it, you shouldn't be doing it. And there's plenty of value to be obtained and created at each stage. So the way to think about it is I divide it up into sort of the pivot point. So the village stage, which is sort of in the middle, stage three is the pivot point. Before that, you got family and tribe. Things are very informal thing. There's not a lot of process. Everyone knows each other. Everything's done on personal relationships. That, by the way, is also the stage that I prefer. I always preferred companies that were smaller. And then village is the pivot point because the village, you got 100, 200. All of a sudden, you can't know everyone. You have to start putting in processes. You have to start changing the way you do things. And then on the other side of village, city and nation, it's definitely, you know, a real company, but that means it has to be structured. You have to do all these different things. And even a company like Zappos, where the late, great Tony founded and ran the company, and they, they tried this experiment to holacracy. The fact is, trying to run a 2,000-person company, there's only, a kind of, there's only a couple ways you can do it. And even Zappos ended up having to do that. And so you have to decide which stage you really enjoy and are good at. Now, if you're a founder, you may say, I want to see this one all the way through. I want to Zuckerberg this thing. Great. But if you're going to do that, you have to understand that as you go from stage to stage, all the lessons you learn that serve you well at one stage probably are useless at the next stage. So you've got to be willing to throw out the way you did things before and learn quickly how to do things in a new way. And if you do that, then you can continue growing and, and be successful all through that stage. But if you don't want to do that, you may be like Vic or me. It's like, uh, you know what? I like the early stages. See you later. Which is, I think, I, I, Chris, reading the book, it's, it's really interesting. I'm a, I'm a total history buff. I love the philosophy. We, we nerd out together. I think there's an interesting theory of going from tribe to village or village to city, which is at the beginning stage, when you're going for efficiency, we hire the best, right? Like it's, you hire the best person, the smartest person you can find. You're super, super picky. But when you're trying to like, you know, grow up 40% month over month, in the book, you say you kind of hire like good enough, which, which most of us cannot get our head around hiring good enough or the idea that this person is temporarily in that role. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I would use any, any time to say ship a thesis, but in general, can you explain the concepts of, of, of this, this build out? Excellent. So we're going to really get a chance to nerd out. So the concept of the ship of Theseus is a philosophical concept. Don't forget, you know, I studied a bunch of philosophy and stuff, but Reed actually has a master's degree in philosophy from Oxford University in England. So he's a Marshall scholar. He, he actually wrote the foreword to this book that, that Brad Feld and Dave Jilk did on the day of the weekly Nietzsche for entrepreneurs. So he loves philosophy. So the ship of Theseus is this philosophical thought experiment. It refers to the ship of Theseus that brought Theseus back from Crete to Athens. If you remember your Greek mythology, Theseus fought the Minotaur and he rescued the Athenians and brought them back to brought them back to Athens. Anyways, the ship of Theseus is like, okay, we have this ship, this very famous ship, and we have it on display. And every once in a while, some of the wood goes bad, and then we replace it with new wood. And you keep doing this over and over again. And at the end of the day, every single piece that was originally in the boat is gone and all of the boat is new wood. None of it goes all the way back to the original, uh, original ship. And so the question becomes, is that still the same ship? Because at every given point, each replacement just made a tiny little incremental change. Is it still the same ship? This is like the question from Star Trek. If you go through the transporter, is it still you? Anyways, the point about ship of Theseus and the companies that we go with is, you know, what you need to do is you need to try to figure out you're replacing people all the way along. The people who are there at the early stages may not want to stick around or after the company goes public, they may be so rich. They just can't stick around. They're, they're going to call in rich. And so you're going to have to have a whole new set of people over at LinkedIn. You know, if you think about it, LinkedIn, 
I think that the the last of the the last of the co-founders that still is there uh, on you know actually as a quote unquote employee because Reed was an executive chairman and so on and so forth is Alan Blue and Alan's only there a couple of days a week and so is it still LinkedIn? Well, what they did is try to figure out what their essential LinkedIn is. Or with Apple, obviously Steve's gone. Steve Wozniak's not there. Where's the continuity there? Is there an essential Appleness that you can establish as part of the culture? And that's how you overcome the ship of Theseus. But what you do want, what you have to understand is you are replacing the planks all the time. As Vic pointed out, hire people that are going to help you at the stage you're at now. They may not work for future stages. That's okay as long as you're very clear up front about we're hiring you for this stage and. Hopefully it'll work in the future, but we're not making any promises. Where you go wrong is where someone says, you know what? I ran the engineering department when we had three people. So therefore, I will also be running the engineering department when we have 30,000 people. Yeah. And there's an interesting part to the to it, which I, I'm surprised we didn't pick up, pick up on. But there is a part of the, the, the theory, which is if you preserved every piece of wood you replaced and you built another ship, which one's the ship, right? Exactly. Which, which is interesting because I tried to explain to a few people that the PayPal spinouts have been tremendous, right? If you look at the people that were at PayPal that spun out, you have Reed, obviously, you have Teal who started Palantir, you have um, you have uh, Teal, uh, not Teal, uh, Musk, right? And so he started yep. SpaceX and, and Tesla. But most people don't know the, the first the, some of the early engineers at PayPal then started YouTube. And Yelp. Right. Chad and Steve. And then Jeremy over at Yelp. Yeah, exactly. And so like, there's a huge amount of spin outs. And I, I do think that's part of the power of the PayPal Mafia uh, friend group, as I tried to tell Armin. We, they don't off people. But they, um, you know, it's, <laughs> it's like mafia. There's is a very famous photograph. I think it was from Vanity Fair. They all dressed up like they were mobsters. Rest assured, none of them dressed like that in real life in any way, shape, or form. But funny, funny story is most of them I've never seen outside of pajamas. So I think. I think that it's a fun group, but that is part of why the spinouts have worked so well is that they've taken this knowledge base that what Chris alludes to of how to scale these companies tremendously and they had their own money um, and they all invested in each other. And so like the access to, to capital was, was, was easy. Um, Chris, we and they also learned a really important lesson from PayPal, which is that you got to, you've got to, and this is captured in Peter Thiel's book, Zero to One, which is you need to be contrarian and right. Like all these people said, you can't do what you're saying you're going to do right. and you're going to be shut down and none of this is going to work. And what they learned is that conventional wisdom is often wrong. And that if you have conviction, that conviction can be rewarded. Have you seen uh, Paul Graham's most recent uh, tweets? I haven't seen them yet. Oh, yeah. I usually yeah. wait for his essays. Ha having new ideas is a lonely business, which is a great quote, right? And I like Peter is a smart person, but it's, it's funny when you read zero to one and you're like, oh yeah, obviously. I just think of the idea that it's common knowledge that is wrong. It's like, well, actually, that that step that is like <laughs> he writes it so eloquently that so easy is the hardest step you can find. Yeah, and by the way, you may be able to find this somewhere. I mean, the the, the other thing that's fascinating is, and again, Reed was uh, Reed was there because he was old friends with with Peter from when they were very young at Stanford. But you know, it's interesting because they're most of the pay most of the founding PayPal guys came out of. Peter Thiel Stanford Review, the arch conservative paper there. And I argued in a piece, which I think I called G GOP to IPO back in those days. I think I argued that, you know, they were contrarian, even when they were in college. Yeah. They were always willing to go against the grain and be disliked. And that served them well in building up the company. Although, again, you could argue Peter Thiel continues to be disliked by a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, Elon, Elon surprisingly is liked by people. Um, Although, it's, you know, he, they'll turn on him. You, you know, there, there was a lot of, there's a lot of consternation about him going on Saturday Night Live. Look, lovely person, very strange, but everyone's kind of Asperger's in that, in that group. I thought he was, res I thought he did a respectable job on Saturday Night Live. Look, he wasn't, you know, there's no Justin Timberlake, but I didn't expect him to be. Yeah, for a rich dude, he did just fine. Uh, Chris, we have a few questions. And Caitlin, I think I have opinions. Chris has opinions. I don't know. We're, 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 we're kind of think about it. We're opinionated guys. Exactly. <laughs> you, ha you have to be, by the way, to run companies. Because as I tell people, you try to give people money where, like Chris is saying, you ha they have to have an idea that is, is it's, it's a little off, right? Um, we can talk about the TAM of Airbnb as a fun side note. 
Um, but they have to run into walls and they have to be stupid enough or smart enough to run into the wall, but smart enough to realize when the wall is actually a wall and, and, and not just trying to break through something that's unbreakable. Right? Um, so Kaylin asked about prioritizing your first 10 systems over your first 10 people. Um, documentation, company culture, and I would argue, Kaylin, I think Chris will probably, I don't know what Chris will say. Uh, I would argue that your first 10 people are your culture. And so you're, the first 10 people, there, there is an amazing stat, which Stefan Cohen, who started Palantir, he interviewed the first 3,000 employees personally at the company. Never happens. Like you, you, you I, I, I tapped out around 70, 75 people and you just can't, for the rate of hiring, you just can't meet everyone um, and have a real opinion that matters. Um, but I do believe that since they will hire the next person, the, the culture gets weaker, but the stronger you start it, the better. Um, and I'm not one for systems at the beginning, even though I'm one for systems in life. Uh, just, I'd rather you build than, than, than set up systems. Yeah, so one of, the, one of the things we have, we have these clickbaity, BuzzFeed-like uh, uh, counterintuitive rules of blitz scaling because they're, they're intended to be like, what, these guys are insane. And one of them is embrace chaos. And a big thing is, I mean, there's so much uncertainty at the early stages. That first 10 employees, you build a system at that point in time, it's wrong. It's, you're going to have to throw it out in like three months. And you don't have to necessarily throw out the people. So it's better to just grab people. And the thing about the people that you're, you're going into the foxhole with, you know, it's a combination of things. It doesn't mean you have to love them and always get along with them. Let me tell you, that group at PayPal was a very combative group. I mean, Vic knows from personal experience. But they respected each other and they found ways to work together. And so get some amazing people. And Reed always puts it this way. It's like, if you can't imagine starting the company without them, that's the person you want to have on board. Yeah, they, they would tell you they surround themselves with, with smart people. And I said, that's, that's great to say, but it happened that your smart people were actually really smart. It's hard to know, right? Smart is relative. And so like, I guess find people smarter than you and hopefully you can find someone smarter than you. Um, okay, so this question, Lane, how, oft, how often do late entrants to a market beat the early entrants simply because they're able to blitz scale more quickly? Um, that is a total Chris question. All the time all the time and again i can't take credit for this this is a peter thielism but as he put it google wasn't the first search engine but it was the last search engine and you know obviously there are things like DuckDuckGo and, and maybe neva who knows but uh, the point is google is utterly dominant and in the book we actually talk about this i'm like apple is not the first personal computer cisco was not the first router none of these microsoft was not the first company to build an operating system i mean what you have to do is you have to dominate the market. And so be, first mover advantage is an illusion. It's first scalar advantage. Yeah. Hey, Chris, I, we're, we're, we're rapid with a funny story. Not, not rapid, but there's a funny. So I looked at, I, I, did, I did Facebook with the other PayPal guys, um, but I only did the B because I wasn't invited to the A party. But then I, I did look at it again for like it's D or E. And we were up against the, the MySpace cap. Okay, so like there was this phase where I had like 10 million users and everything, Friendster, capped to 10 million. MySpace, capped to 10 million. And so we were looking at the investment. I, I ended up doing it um, against, against my, my personal thoughts at the time. And everyone was like- Good decision. Yeah, yeah, I mean, theoretically, right? Like outcome doesn't always make it a good decision. As you know, Chris, you can talk to our wives. But um, at the end of the day, it's like they have this 10 million cap. How do you know you're gonna hit the next S curve, right? Peter has this, famous S curve. You don't want to, if the technology goes in an S, you yeah. don't want to be the first person on the S because you waste too much money proving out the S and figuring out how to do the S. You don't want to be too late on the S because the dude that's early, like at the right time of the S will crush it. How do you know where you are on that cycle? So what I always tell people is this. So there's all this, all these people in Silicon Valley who talk about how they could they are at pattern recognition. I'm like, pattern recognition is for suckers. <laughs> pattern recognition means you just blindly like a cargo cult saying, oh, well, you know, people are doing this. Therefore, planes will land and drop stuff for us. Right. They're not thinking about the actual mechanism of action. And so I stole that term from the pharmaceutical industry, mechanism of action, which is what is it about this chemical compound that we give to you that actually makes you 
better. That actually cures your sickness. And so when it comes to something like that, let's say you're facing the MySpace cat. The question becomes, okay, I want to understand what's actually going on. So I want to go in and I want to look at, maybe even do, do anthropological studies, observe what the hell is happening with the users. And if you did that with Friendster or MySpace, you would very rapidly figure out what the problem was. Like with Friendster, be like, this page is taking two minutes to load. This fucking sucks. <laughs> or in the case of MySpace, it's like, oh man, every single page is like blinking at me constantly. This is the worst, this is the worst bullshit possible. Uh, we, let's talk about TAM really fast, a total addressable market. I, I, I'll give you guys two funny stories around TAM. One is I looked at Uber rather early and I told Travis that it was kidnap.com because I'm not, my mom told me not to get in a car with a stranger, right? And it's like, you're, you're telling me people are going to get a car with a stranger. The other one is the other Travis, Travis Bander Zanden, which I learned my lesson. So he's, he was a CEO of Lyft and Uber. And then he called me for the seed round for Bird. It's this little scooter company. And if you guys imagine back when Bird was founded, what is the fastest unicorn? I think it still is the fastest unicorn. Nine months to a billion valuation, which was just fantastic, by the way. Um, it's 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 a fascinating one because he calls me. He's like, "We're going to do scooters," and you're just like, "The market size for scooters is seven, right?" My my seven year old is the market for scooters. Um, can you, Chris? Can you go over like how you how you figure out Airbnb is at, people want to sleep on couches? Like, how do you figure that out when, when you probably have never slept on a couch? Right. Well, uh, yeah, I, I have slept on a couch before. I once slept on a chair in a dormitory. I've done all sorts of things in my time. But let, let's talk about the, the TAM. And what you have to do is you have to make predictions about the future. So in the case of Uber, for example, like I said, kidnap.com, if, even if you got over the fact that it seems freaky that you get into a stranger's car, which is exactly what people who are old like us were taught never to do. Like, oh, look. This un I call this unmarked white van. Let me get inside. Here's a piece um, of candy. There we go. Free candy. What's, what's not to love? Five stars. But the thing about Uber was, if you thought about Uber as this is like taxis, you would say this is of a limited market size. But if you thought of it as, hey, this is a replacement for having a car. This is a replacement for all these different things. The answer is, when you fundamentally change the market, the market may be much bigger than the current market. And really, most of the time, the big opportunities come from realizing that the market is actually a lot bigger than people think. Yeah. And so in the case of scooters, it's about micro mobility and primarily people getting around inside a big city because walking takes a long time and waiting for an Uber takes a long time. You're just trying to go a short, period, short distance. Um, Airbnb is another great example. So Reed led the Series A round. But they had approached him before. They had approached him a couple of times and not directly. Uh, various investors had reached out to him. He's, and the way he described it, and he doesn't name this person, but there was an investor who described it to him. He's like, it's great. It's like, it makes it really easy to do couch surfing. And he was like, couch surfing? Nobody's going to want to do that. That's just idiotic. And they, they, that, so he passed. And then somebody came around and said, listen, you really need to look at Airbnb for the series. A. This is an incredible company. These are incredible founders. You really love them. And he's like, well, that's that couch surfing company. He's like, no, that's not what they do. They do this and this. He's like, well, that's interesting. And he goes and he does a meeting with them. This actually, this took place, I think on a Sunday afternoon. They go up to his office at Greylock on a Sunday afternoon and they meet with me. And they say, listen, what you have to understand is this is essentially eBay for space of all kinds. And it's like, well, that's a huge vision. And two minutes into the meeting, he tells them, listen, guys, I'm going to give you a term sheet. So let's spend the rest of this time figuring out how we can work together. And then he took it to the partner meeting the next day. And there was a lot of debate because a bunch of the partners were like, this is insane. What's wrong with people? Why would anyone stay in someone in some stranger's home? And famously, Dave Z, who is also a friend, who is one of the greatest guys imaginable, and who, who brought Reed to Greylock, invested in Reed and LinkedIn, told Reed at the end, after all this debate, he's like, listen, every venture capitalist has to have some big failed deal that they do that they can learn from. So Airbnb can be your learning opportunity. Yeah, I mean, that one, everyone in the Valley, like we talk about how it's passed. Happening. Everyone passed. Every, I saw that deal three times. Every, everyone passed on that deal. Um, Hilarious. What a, what a funny, you know, do you know, do you know the story of how they got into YC, YC, Y Combinator? 
The the story with Mike Mike and in his underwear at South by Southwest, yes. But also they had the Obama O's and the yeah, the Obama O's. Yeah, these guys at Air, these guys made fake cereal that the boxes that they sold for ten dollars each. Whereas Obama O's and Captain McCain's, which is a Captain Crunch riff, and that that they they kind of financed the company for a while doing these cereal boxes. They um, made forty thousand dollars that way. Hustle. And that was the thing that convinced Paul Graham to let them in. And there, we have this, we did this interview with Brian about that experience. And he said, and he said, I remember thinking to myself, as we're gluing these cereal boxes together, and I'm getting paper cuts, and I'm burning my hands with hot milk food. He's like, I bet Mark Zuckerberg never had to do anything like this. Ever. What the hell am I doing? But they did. I mean, hustlers. I mean, it kind of gets to our combined Michelle and Sophie's question, which is. One is how, what, what's your advice for networking? The other one is what do you look for in a, fa- in a founder? But, you know, Brian, Brian, if you guys have ever watched an interview or pitched Chris's uh, podcast right now, you, go, you guys should all listen. It's, it's very, it's really, it's a really good use of time. But you, Hustler, a Hustler is definitely kind of high on the list. Um, you know, I, I, I stopped looking at idea a long time ago because I, I, I proved to myself that people want to sleep on couches and I don't get the normal consumer. So the other thing I would say in, in terms of like, you know, obviously if, if you're absolutely right, Vic, what people are looking for is somebody, well, let's put it this way, somebody who is determined and persistent and can make the impossible happen, but also somebody that people will follow, right? Because at the end of the day, nobody does this alone. Reed likes to say entrepreneurship is a team sport. You gotta be able to convince other people to go on the journey with you. And that's part of what the, where the networking comes in, right? It is hard to recruit a co-founder or a T executive if you've never met them before. It can be done and it happens all the time, but it's hard. And so it's much easier if you are constantly, anytime you meet someone amazing, developing a relationship and staying in touch. And that one of the things that I think that great leaders do is every great leader is always recruiting. And they're always on the lookout for talent because Talent is the number one thing. Look, you can get money. You just heard Vic describe how he and I have to beg people to take our money. If you're doing a good job, people will beg you to take their money. But getting great people to work for you, that's harder. Yeah. I tell tell people, I talk talk to the students. I I, I enjoy these things. But in general, like everything in life compounds. Your network compounds. Your money will compound. Your brain will compound, right? Like you, you can choose to shrink your network. You can choose to grow your network. You can choose to like work out every day and get like healthier, or you can choose to not work out every day and get less healthy. But in general, everything kind of compounds. Um, unfortunately, you only have so much time in a day, so you just gotta figure out what's what's right for you. You know, people might ask you, Vic, the same question they often ask me, which is, how do you know so many famous and successful people? And I'm curious if you give the same answer I give. Uh, how do I? I know them because I know them. It's a really weird. It's a really weird state of events. You kind of meet your first one, and then they kind of like famous people. Look, my group is not. My group is weirdly famous, right? The PayPal guys are not actually famous. If you you guys would not see if Elon's saw, actually famous now. Well, now people because of Saturday Night Live will recognize him walking down the street. No, no one would recognize him two years ago walking. No one will. Luke Nosek. Yeah, no one, no, no, nobody would ever recognize Luke walking down the street, or even Good Peter. Nobody would even recognize Peter, and he spoke yeah. at a freaking uh, nominating convention. No one would recognize Peter. Reed, Reed, maybe. I mean, there are people that look more unique, right, than like just like dude in suit. Um, but in general, you walk around the valley, and you're gonna walk past Paul Graham, and you won't even recognize him. So the the which is very which is similar. So the answer I always give people is listen. You know, you just meet a lot of smart and interesting people and you wait because, you know, the people, let let me put it this way. Anybody who is like a rich, famous billionaire, famous celebrity, whatever, famous entrepreneur, whatever, they got everyone in the world trying to meet them. So when you're meeting people who are young and smart and interesting and talented and you stay in touch, they end up doing some amazing things. Like, you know, there's a, there's an entrepreneur named Jessica Ma. She created a company called Mm -hmm. Indonero. Great. Jessica's great. She's an amazing woman. And she was my intern when she was in college. Was she a Teal Fellow? I think she was a Teal Fellow. I think she may have even predated the Teal Fellows existence. Yeah, she's great. She, in the narrative, she's, she's incredible. She's, incredible. She's, she's an incredible, incredible woman. But like I said, 
she was my she she worked for me as a summer intern when she was in college but you know what the summer intern that you have may someday be a superstar entrepreneur if you if the person is smart and talented and makes things happen stay in touch with them yeah i like that yeah because i knew these guys before they were all these guys right like so i think it's um yeah you just sometimes get lucky with who you know exactly Cal Poly will do something like someone in your classes right someone in this club will do something yeah i guarantee it uh, I, I guarantee i i will, I will place this bet right now which is no one will remember it but we are recording it that if in 10 years we gather again there's going to be more than one of the students who are on this call who are going to be enormously successful and have been you know I would say on magazine cover, except I'm not sure if there will be magazines then, but you get what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, and the not- way to stay in touch with me, by the way, is, you know, very, this is terribly stereotypical, but, you know, go on to LinkedIn and you can find me there. You'll note that there are multiple Chrissiers, but you've seen me and you know, this is, <laughs> you can figure it out, right? Uh, so look for, look for me reach out to me. And when you say, I want to connect or whatever, just mention, Hey, you know, I was in the audience when you and Vic were talking and you told me that someday one of us would be hugely successful. I'm going to be that person. I want to stay in touch. Yeah. I think Chris, both of our jobs are very similar. We probably look at a thousand companies, 2000 companies a year. I mean, you know, you, you have to very politely say no, and you have to say it rather quickly, but in general, I, I, the students that reach out to me randomly on LinkedIn have the, they, they, I, I usually accept it right away because there's this hustle, right? Like most people won't just try to connect with someone that they don't really know super well. But um, it's very but, important to actually mention when you saw me yeah. because otherwise I won't necessarily know. I mean, it's sometimes I might, I might take again, like, I'm like, oh, they're a student at, at, at Cal Poly. All right. Then I know they were here for the next like 14 hours or 24 hours. <laughs> But in general, it's better just to say, hey, I saw you at this and you said to connect with me. Yeah, the, the personal message. I, I always like, you, you, most people will not take offense at saying no to you. I mean, you'll take offense with Chris saying no to you when you, when you beg him for money. But if it's, <laughs> you don't want to send me money. You always want to- I'll say, no, no, go, go, go ask Nick. Got more. Always send me money. Um, but yeah, I think the personal note is always good. I think that, you know, having a good connection and, and just, you guys have the most opportune time to to connect now. Um, and I'm with Chris, drive up to the Valley. I think that's the one thing I, jo- I think John York's on here. You, you used to at least always drive up once a year or something and do a gathering at someone's office or some startup or just to meet people. I, that is the most valuable thing you guys can do at school. You you don't have, oh, hopefully, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe. You probably don't have children you're supporting. You probably don't have a spouse you're supporting. This is the time you guys can run super lean and just try stuff. Absolutely. Listen, I've got, I, there are some entrepreneurs I've helped who, when I met them, they were living at home with their parents to save money. And now they've got, you know, a hundred plus employees, 20 million in the bank, rapidly growing businesses. I mean, this is just how it works. Do what it takes, hustle. And the amazing thing, look, they're, the chances are still against you. Let me put this, let me emphasize this. We're not gonna be unrealistic here, right? The vast majority of companies that get started fail. Most of our investments don't work out and it's hard, but the possibility is there and the possibility is greater than just about any other time in history, just about any other place in history. There's a lot of fax machines to replace still, but I I will say the ideas get better, right? Like I'm a big proponent of people going to work in real industry because in real industry, you see real problems. Yeah. The, the problems that you guys are exposed to right now, you, you don't know how a nuclear power plant works. But you know, if you work at one, you might find some problems. Bingo. Exactly. The world does not need more dating apps aimed at 21-year-olds. Hey, Chris, have I ever told you the mom, the mom theory of startups? I told this Fire to away. So usually when we, when you meet the younger students at Stanford or whatever, they always have the mom idea, right? Like the, 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 the three ideas I always hear are something in music, because for some reason you guys are very attracted to music startups or like some payment thing, which is like, I live with four people, the calculator is hard to use. I want to type in like my power bill and you split the bill for me or the replace my mom app, which is like, can you do my laundry? Can you tell me where to eat? Can you drive me over there? Can you like clean my shoes? 
those are the three ideas I usually hear. Um, and ideas get better, right? You guys have to cycle through a whole bunch of ideas. And, and by the way, the most important, and this is, this is advice that very few people ever take from me, but I'll offer it anyways. The most important thing is to find that market, right? So find a market where they spend money and maybe even a market that other people have neglected and figure out what they actually want and need. And if you start with a market that you enjoy, right? Don't go like, oh, I, I want to market to, you know, some sort of nasty group of criminals. No, no, no. Go to a market that you would enjoy serving and figure out what they actually want and give them something. And better if that market it happens to be like CIOs or something like that who have a lot of money. <laughs> so yeah, or, or they're spending other people's money, so they don't care about the cost. Yeah. Um, those are the best markets to be in. But yeah, I 100% agree. You guys should remember that where you spend money is someone's profit. And when you run a company where you're spending money is someone else's profit. And so I spent my whole career starting companies where I didn't want to spend that much money in wherever I was, wherever I was spending it. Jake, Chris, thank you guys so much. Um, yeah, we went five minutes over time. I, I could listen to you guys talk all day. Honestly, I wish we had an extra hour, but um, that was super valuable. I'm sure everyone got a lot of that. It was super enjoyable. Uh, thank you for jo joining us. Uh, this is awesome. Thanks for having us. Uh, everyone, thanks for joining. I hope this was this was valuable for y'all. And uh, we'll see y'all next week. Beck, Chris, thank you again. Chris, coffee oh, on me, whenever you want it. Always a pleasure. Like I said, May 20th. After that, we're good. We're going to, yeah, we're going to drink some whiskey. All right, everyone, have a good one. Good luck in midterms. Thank, thank you so thank much. You. Guys. Don't thank forget you. to send the note. Include the note in the invitation. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thank you.